you know, there's this pervasive belief out there in the kind of innocuous nature of pornography and this idea that we're talking with some wistfulness about a playboy under your grandfather's mattress. Um, maybe not your grandfather, but just one's grandfather. And, and we're here to talk because this is not your grandfather's pornography that we're talking about. And that's not what we're seeing. And so it feels incredibly important that we take this time to really look at this. And I'm joined today by three incredible um, women leaders in this space. And I will just go ahead and introduce them and then we'll dive right in. So first is Tanya Morris. Tanya is the Training and Survivor Leadership Manager at My Life, My Choice. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with Tanya since she came to My Life, My Choice as a survivor mentor in 2015. And since then she's been promoted several times, taken on increased responsibilities as part of our nationally renowned training team and as a coach to new survivor mentors. In all of her roles, she uses her lived experiences, extensive training and expertise, and years of practice wisdom to support young victims and educate service providers and law enforcement. Thanks for being here, Tanya. Second, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Gail Dines. When um, those of us at My Life, My Choice think of the work to combat pornography and really shift norms, the first person we think of is Gail Dines. She's someone we really look up to. She's been researching and writing about the harms of pornography for well over 30 years. She's the founding president and CEO of the nonprofit Culture Reframed. And if you have not yet gone to their website, um, Kaylin, could you put it in the chat, please? I really urge you to do so. Um, she's dedicated to building resilience and resistance in children and youth to the harms of a hypersexualized and pornified society. And third, um, our dear colleague, Beth Bouchard. She is the Associate Director of the Children's Advocacy Center of Suffolk County. She oversees the CAC's Support to End Exploitation Now program, which provides a collaborative interagency response for at-risk and commercially sexually exploited youth in Suffolk County, Massachusetts. We've had the pleasure of working with the scene since 2005 and Beth's leadership far reaches beyond Suffolk County and throughout the state and nationally around how to respond in a coordinated multidisciplinary way. So without further ado, we're going to dive into hearing from these three incredible panelists and then have some time for questions and answers at the end. As you think of things that come to mind, please drop them into the chat. Um, Kaylin from our team will be pulling those together and we'll have a chance to answer those in the last minutes. So I'm gonna begin with you, Tanya. When folks think of pornography, they don't usually think of the commercial sexual exploitation of children. I know that you personally have worked with young people who've been through this. Can you kind of begin our time together by giving us a sense of their stories and who they are? Yeah, thank you for that question, Lisa. Um, and you said the key word, children. And I can, tell, I can tell you like a couple of stories from my experience in working with mentees. Um, we had a young lady, um, named Linda, um, I'm, obviously I'm changing her name. Um, she was referred to My Life, My Choice at the age of 17. Um, she was going to high school. Um, she was attending like stuff after high school. She was taking care of siblings at home, getting them dressed for school, um, taking care of them. They was living in a shelter uh, with their mom and their mom was struggling with addiction. And while she was in high school, she met a young man who was hanging around the high school. They it was questionable whether he was still going. He wasn't, but he was hanging more outside of the school than anything. And um, they ended up getting into a serious relationship. And um, it started being like a weekend thing and then an everyday thing. And um, she was the type of kid that wore her heart on her sleeve. And she believed that this boy loved her. And um, they end up he ended up taking a video of them engaging in sex. And um, from, from there, he sold it on Pornhub. She didn't know it was gonna go that far. And then I have another young lady. She was referred to my life, my choice at the age of 14. At the, then at the age of 16, um, she, like, she was in school, she was doing volley, volleyball. This kid was engaged in everything. She was always staying busy. She was engaged in volleyball, basketball. Um, she would stay after school, do after school projects. Um, she had a part-time job. 
And then she met a boy at the school that was a roughly around 17, maybe going on 18 years old. They started dating. She, do, she too fell in love with this kid. Um, and after they was, you know, being together for a while, then she started feeling that their, their love was kind of like questionable. She started like not feeling the love from him. So he started feeling a lot jealous of her in this relationship. Um, they took a video. She was aware of the video, engaging in sex. Um, and then he decided that he wanted to sell this video to classmates. Um, it went viral in school. People knew about it, teachers knew. Teachers saw it, uh, gym teachers saw it. It went viral. Um, until it got out into the community. You're on mute, Lisa. You would think 13 months in, I would not still be on mute, and yet there I am. Um, Tanya, these stories of these young people are different from what most folks think of, I think, when they think of pornography. Can you just speak to what the impact was on them of having those images disseminated, those videos? Yes, um, for the first girl I spoke about, Linda, um, it impacted her family in many ways. In this same high school, her brother was going there. Her brother used to walk up the halls and would see kids watching the video of his sister. He would engage in, in physical altercations with these kids in school. Um, Linda would walk up and down the halls. They would call her names. Can you imagine a kid in school? walking up and down the halls and then you have kids looking at you, calling you names, um, calling you out. She couldn't focus in school. She had no peace. She would go to lunch and kids would be talking to her at lunch. Just like you see in the movies, they get up and move away from her. This is what she was going through in school. Um, she, and then she couldn't take care. She was the type of kid that was taking care of her younger siblings because of her mother's addiction. She shut down and went into a shell. She could no longer take care of these her siblings. She could no longer be there to feed them, get them out to school. She would stay in her room constantly. Um, and she used to beat herself up a lot. And she said to me one day, she said, Tanya, she goes, the, hurt, the hurtful thing about this, my video will always be out there. Mm -hmm. And that broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And the truth about it is the truth. She knew it, whether it was taken down or not, it would still be out there. And then my second girl, Mary, she instantly went into a deep depression. She, she, stopped, uh, she stopped going to school. Um, um, she, she stopped engaging in stuff after school. Um, and the impact with her, with this boy, this boy got so violent with her, he beat her because she wanted to leave him, right? She, she used to walk home from school. The girls in the community used to come up to her and want to fight her because they saw the video of her because of the young boy put this video out about her. This girl was so broken in the inside. When she was ready to leave him, he beat her so bad, she had to be relocated. We sent her to Florida. We had to relocate her. We had help relocating her family to another city. This girl was being called all kinds of names to where it affected her family so bad to our own siblings started calling her these names because of the video that was out there for her. That impact was so hard on her. And even today, um, she still, she's still impacted by this. And not just that, when you think about, and Gail, you know about this so well, about the mental chains. And after all of this, she went back to the guy. And if you know anything about um, exploitation and things that happen like this, it's the mental chains that lock them up in their mind. So they're so broken and they listen to what these men talk about or what these boys tell them. And she went right back to them. Tanya, thank you so much. Um, while the stories are hard to hear, it paints such a clear picture. Um, Gail, Beyond hearing these stories, why should we care about pornography? Can't folks just say, you know, I choose not to watch it, so it's not my problem, or I do choose to watch it and it isn't a problem. Can you kind of help us understand 
the impact of pornography on our community. I think Tonya answered that question as why well, it doesn't make it any difference whether you watch it or not you are a victim of the industry so let's just talk about what we what's going on in a sort of more I'll just give the sort of cultural context so pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry that in its production and consumption is violence against women and children so we have to think of it as an industry and like every industry it creates norms values and ideologies and this I think one of the most the most damaging ideology that pornography gives out is that women are disposable sex objects to be commod women and girls to be commodified monetized bought and sold what you what tonya discussed happens within that context of what the pornography industry is set about women and girls and also boys i mean where does boy where do boys and men get the idea that they have the male privilege to buy and sell women's bodies images etc so the problem with any industry it's like saying look you know the fast food industry is no big deal because i don't eat fast food well it's destroying the environment it's causing obesity it's a public health crisis just like pornography is so when we get away from the individualistic thing and we understand look, i might never look at well i do look at pornography of course all the time but supposing i never did I don't know about the guy who's walking behind me in the street, right? I don't know what he's just been jerking off to. I have no idea how that's going to come and impact my life and any young girl's life. And when we listen to the life, especially of young women who have been brought up in a porn culture, they have been left to navigate this whole new world all by themselves. And when I say to them, how are you doing? They all say the same thing. We're drowning. We've got no help. I mean, I think it's very hard for those of us who were not brought up in a porn culture to understand the world of young people today and you know we talk about consent and this was one of the things i'm beginning to believe that consent is a completely meaningless term right if you are socialized from birth to be a female you are being socialized into being or rather groomed by the culture and by the porn culture to be a compliant victim in patriarchy. So I think we need to throw out the whole concept of consent and begin to really ask, in fact, how do girls say no to anything in a culture where you've been told to say yes, 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 yes. And in fact, that your identity as a female is based on your willingness or rather so-called willingness to exploit yourself sexually. I was just on another call and um, actually I did a webinar in Paris and somebody asked, what do I think about um, as a feminist activism, free the nipple campaign. Do people, have people heard about this? Where you, and I said, you know what, I'll sign on to that after we have free the testicle campaign. I want to see men walking around with their penises hanging out and their testicles. Why is it always women's bodies on which we write the script of the politics of our world? So we leave men and we live, leave them with bodily integrity and it's our bodies via the porn industry that are sold out there and give men the concept that they have the privilege with or without our consent and consent being almost meaningless to take what they want from us so i would argue that men who rape who get into exploiting women sexually in any way are not deviant they are conformists to a rape culture and merely playing out that which they have learned incredibly well said can you share more about what the research says about when boys first see pornography and what that pornography is like okay well you said not your grandfather's playboy it's not your father's playboy right? either. i mean let's talk about that so what we know is that the average age studies show of first viewing hardcore mainstream free porn on pornhub is 11 although we're now getting anecdotal evidence as young as seven and eight now these boys some a lot of it is accidental they come across it but those who are looking for it when they put things like they don't put porn into google they put butt or they put you know big tits or something like this they are catapulted into a world of sexual torture mm -hmm. mainstream pornography today is sexual torture and fact goes against all the torture treaties that countries have signed on to pornography is non-state torture when you think about it um, because of what happens to women, they are strangled, they are gagged till they can't breathe with a penis, they are spat upon, they are penetrated orally, any vaginally, they are ejaculated on, 
any kind of de degrading, debasing, dehumanizing act that you can do to a woman, as long as you sexualize it, because you have to sexualize it, so it wasn't sexualized, you would be found doing something illegal. But what you do is when you sexualize the violence that you do to women in pornography, you render the violence invisible. And it is absolute. I mean, if, if this was any other group other than women, I have to tell you, they would be for the Hague for violation of human rights. But because it's women, it's fun, it's entertaining, it's free speech, you know, our bodies are not speech. Our bodies are real material things which are the currency of patriarchy and pornography is the most clearest, succinct and crispest way of delivering, most crisp way of delivering this message to men, to men's penis and to men's brain via the penis. That's what pornography does. It delivers patriarchy ideology to their brain via the penis, which is an extremely efficient delivery system. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Lisa. You're on mute, Lisa. Still, my, okay, I apologize. What does that look like for boys as they grow up? What do we see over time? Okay. Well, we see it not even over time, pretty quickly, actually. So we have 40 years of empirical research, but the most important research is the last 10 years, 15 years with the internet. So we know the younger boys get to porn and the more porn they see, the more they are likely to sexually aggress against a girl or a woman, the more likely they are to sexually harass, the more likely they are to rape, the less capacity they have for intimacy, the less capacity they have for connection, the more depression and anxiety they have, the more erectile dysfunction they have, the less interest they have in partnering with women, the less interest they have in sex. And they have themselves developed a sexual template which mirrors what they've been watching in pornography. And so people who are out there who argue that pornography has no effect, actually, it's not up to us to prove it has an effect. It is so clearly obvious that this is going to have an effect. It's up to the other side to prove to us it has no effect. Because if that would be the case, that porn had no effect, it would be the only industry in the world that did not affect the culture in any way. And that's not possible, especially given the power of the industry, which actually is image based. And we know that images carry way more weight than print because they lodge themselves in that part of the brain that does not um, have frontal lobe activity. So you tend to believe that which you see. That's, that's who we are, evolution -wise. If we weren't, what would we do when we saw a car? Would we stand there if a car was coming at us and say, now is that a car and has it got four wheels and it's coming at me, but should I deconstruct it before I decide to jump out the way? We are evolutionary beings who have to believe that which we see. So when people say, well, men know porn's not real, we don't have a second brain to say this is real and this isn't real. It works in the brain and on the body and it mm. gives them a thud via orgasm. And can you make ties to other aspects of the commercial sex industry for us, other yes. forms of sexual exploitation? Yes. So pornography grooms both girls into porn. I think the best way to put it um, was uh, Joanna Angel, who's a pornographer. And she said, the women these days, they come to the set porn ready. Where are they learning to go to a set or to think that way? So pornography grooms girls and gets them ready for pornographies, for the pimps, for the traffickers, because it tells them your body is there to be used and abused by men. So it grooms the girls. And on the other side, it's the major driver of demand to prostituted. I'm going to say prostituted, not trafficked. I'm going to be become, they're interchangeable. So I say it's the major. Oh, yeah, driver. I need you to be quiet as possible. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> so um, it's a major driver of demand to prostituted women, because look, when you're um, developing a sexual template via violent, violent sex, you know, most women won't do that. So if you want to play that out, you have to go to a group who can't say no. And who can't say no? Women who are being prostituted because their pimps will kill them rather than let them go. So absolutely, you're setting up women and girls. And what you're doing is you're increasing both the women and girls who are ending up being trafficked and you're increasing the um, actual johns and the pimps as well. You're training the pimps through. It is an incredible training problem. Thank God somebody like Hitler didn't have at his disposal pornography because it's better than any propaganda I've ever seen. Mm. Mm. That's incredibly powerfully said. Um, what can we do? What can service providers do? What can parents do? What are the most important things? 
Okay, what parents can do is go to our free programs at culturereframe.org, hit on the parents program. We spent three years developing two programs built by um, multiple disciplines of pediatricians, neuroscientists, adolescent health experts, parent experts, they're accessible, they're free, and they teach parents. And you can go in for five days, five minutes, five hours, they're sort of user-friendly. And they teach parents how to build skills, confidence and knowledge to have those important conversations with their kids. And what we say is don't have one hundred minute conversation with your kid about porn. Have a hundred one minute conversations with your kid. And we even have conversations scripted out at the end of the program. Mm -hmm. And I want to stress it's free and we made it free so that anyone with irrespective of socioeconomic access. So one of the most important things is learning about the issue and then learning how to speak to your kids without shaming or blaming. If we want to shame and blame, we shame and blame the porn industry and we shame and blame the culture that allows this to continue, not the kids, not even the boys who are watching it. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing we do is we have to need legislation to go to regulate the hell out of the porn industry. We need to regulate it to such a degree that it becomes too cumbersome to produce it or distribute it. Meanwhile, it is the only above ground, multi-billion dollar a year industry that is virtually completely unregulated. Unregulated. Imagine if you didn't regulate tobacco or alcohol, what the world would mm -hmm. look like. And so now you can get boys get free porn on their cell phone. It's the equivalent of me standing outside in middle school and handing out bottles of beer or cigarettes every single day. And it's also equivalent to me knocking on people's doors and saying, excuse me, do you have a young kid here? Well, give him this packet of cigarettes. And by the way, I'll be back here tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And they said, and let me in the bedroom because that's where the pornographers are, in the bedroom with the kids. These are people you wouldn't want within 10 miles of your kids. Why are you letting them in the bedroom with your kids? So we need to regulate the hell out of this industry so it can no longer function. Thank you so much for this. And I can just um, attest um, both as a service provider, but as a parent to the resources of Culture Reframed, I will say that my poor two, my two sons growing up, any long car ride, I would say, what a perfect time to talk about pornography. Like, oh God, why is this my mother? Um, but those resources are really, really exceptional. Thank you, Dale, Thank you. Gail, and we'll be coming back to you. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna to turn to Beth Bouchard, who's gonna help us think about another aspect of this whole picture. Now, in the state of Massachusetts, when a minor sends a nude picture of her, him, their self to another minor, that's a transmission of pornography and it's a crime. How should we think about that? And how is it like what Gail has talked about and how is it different? Thank you, Lisa. So absolutely, while the exchange of pornography, even among minors is technically a crime, our team, our Suffolk County multidisciplinary response team that responds to child abuse and exploitation is interested first and foremost in keeping children and teens safe. Like Gail mentioned, not shaming, not having a punitive response, making it safe for kids to come forward if and when they need help and to learn about this issue. So that is the first priority. And then also pursuing adult offenders who may be targeting youth, looking to exploit them through the exchange of pornography or images. So this means rather than charging children whose images have been shared, or in most circumstances, rather than criminally investigate exchanges of nude, nude content between young people, our team is focused on children and families and providing supportive services, resources, and education. Everything we do is team-based, multidisciplinary cross systems. So we collaborate very closely with other agencies, other disciplines. Um, that means mental health clinicians, medical providers, law enforcement, child welfare workers, survivor mentors at My Life, My Choice, prosecutors and advocates. And we do this intentionally so that we're reviewing concerns of the exchange of images and abuse together. Uh, we're assessing risk for possible, possible abuse, and we're also trying to leverage our collective resources. So really we're providing a comprehensive response to families and wrapping a safety net around them because that's what they need. Um, when or if adults are involved in pornography, involved in the exchange of sexual abuse images, or when youth are exchanging images with somebody whose identity is not known to them, or maybe they think they know who they're talking to, but they're really speaking online with somebody who's much older, um, 
then we do involve law enforcement. They'll be involved to gather information about safety risks, what's really going on, uh, who is that minor communicating with, in trying to help hold offenders, those adults who might be causing harm to children, accountable. And what we see at our center really is a very wide range of referrals related to internet safety, to exploitation, and to image sharing. Typically, each year, we receive about 1,900 referrals for child abuse and trafficking, and about 400 of those in Suffolk County pertain to sexually explicit images, and about 200 pertain to high-risk youth in commercial sexual exploitation. What's really interesting, during COVID, during 2020, the CAC referrals for sexual abuse and for physical abuse dropped significantly by 38% and 41% respectively. And this really fueled concerns that children were outside of the site of caring professionals who might identify abuse and report abuse. But what's really fascinating here is that in contrast to those decreases, the number of sexual exploitation referrals to the CAC remained steady, remained consistent. Exploitation and particularly the exchange of images facilitated through tech continued to thrive in this climate of social isolation. And what we saw with these referrals, they really represent um, a different spectrum, different spectrum of physical risk. So these are the different internet based circumstances that families are dealing with. And despite there being variation among a physical safety risk present for youth, we know that the emotional fallout for each and every child whose image might be shared or shared with other consent can be devastating. So we might become involved when a 12 year old receives inappropriate sexual messages from a stranger that they met through an online gaming platform. Or if an 11 year old records a video of themselves and uploads it on TikTok, or when a child posts a, a naked video of themselves, but someone else hacks into their account, gets the video, maybe shares it with hundreds of other students online. Um, we receive referrals for teens who might be using a dating app to meet other people, but then an adult stranger messages them, picks them up, drives them across the state. Um, or another example I'm thinking of involves a 17 year old who was referred to us because she was missing from home for multiple weeks. Um, and it was discovered on their Instagram account that there were these sexualized photos, conversations with older adults and a link to a cash app. So you can see in some of these instances, the team might be very sincerely worried about possible grooming for commercial sexual exploitation, like Tanya and Gail were describing, um, or potential trafficking. But in all of these circumstances, regardless of whether or not there are immediate physical safety risks, we're extremely concerned about the emotional impact for that child and for their family. So rather than respond in a punitive way, in a manner that might shame someone, like Dr. Dines was talking about, making a child feel responsible, potentially for abuse that they might be experiencing, and potentially discouraging them or scaring them from being able to seek help and ask for what they need, we offer a variety of resources really focused on education and support for families. So we offer our, our CAC has our support to end exploitation now scene program that coordinates a multidisciplinary response to child trafficking. We receive all the referrals for sexual exploitation in our community and facilitate this team response to make sure we're safety planning, service planning collectively with families. But the CAC also offers support through mental health clinicians on site. So these specialists provide psychoeducation, tailored resources depending on the circumstances. They support families talking with young people and their parents or caregivers. They also provide consultation to other professionals and providers that might be working with a family when it's discovered that pornography or sexual abuse images have been exchanged. The other things we try to focus on um, similarly are around specialized training. Our partners at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office developed a training called Stop, Block and Talk to teach youth about internet safety and cyberbullying. And there's different variations for children, for teens, for caregivers and professionals working with youth. Um, and we also offer a curriculum called Navigating Tech and Relationships that's really geared towards both caregivers and youth. Uh, like Dr. Dine said, conversation is critical within families. And so this resource is designed to support family conversations about healthy relationships, boundary setting, the risks of sexting, um, navigating the social and emotional impact for families when images are shared without consent. 
um, and the sessions can occur concurrently. So families are talking together and separately about what youth might be experiencing. Um, finally, most recently, we've created a tech empowerment and media youth council. We're working with local high school students in Boston to create materials uh, for their communities and for their schools to help promote safety and well-being. And because youth are experiencing this ever-present cultural phenomenon and encountering these challenges firsthand every day, we want to be sure to elevate their voices as we work towards solutions. Um, but the bottom line to answer your question is that we want to help, not harm. We want to make sure families who might be experiencing these challenges get support um, and that young people who might be struggling can ask for help when they need it. Thank you for that, Beth. The three of you have painted such a clear picture of kind of what we're up against. And there's some questions that have come in that I would like all of you to, to respond to. How do we have conversations about pornography with peers? Who would like to start? Gail, do you want to begin? With whom? Conversations with kids about? Around porn with peers, I am believe that they're talking about, let's answer it both ways. So how do we, what about if our peers at us as adults consume pornography? How do we address this in our communities? And how do we help young people talk to their peers as well? Well, first of all, in terms of just peer-to-peer -peer, like adult, one of the things we know is, um, you know, there are certain factors when more kids are at risk for watching porn and developing problematic behavioural, um, sexual problematic behaviours. Parents watching porn is a big thing. So first of all, if when parents argue, you know, it's, I have a right to watch porn, etc., this has an impact on the kid because the kid will find the porn. There's no question. They'll find mm -hmm. the porn. And then what you're doing is you're legitimizing the pornography for that kid. So you're setting your own kid up. Then I'm sure parents would think twice if they understood the domino effect that this would have. But I think the more important thing that we need to be thinking about is how do we talk to kids to build resilience and resistance to pornography? Given you can't follow them around 24 hours a day, you have to build an internal moral compass by which they make decisions that they choose not to look at pornography. Just as my generation, you know, was all smoked, my son's generation didn't. And it wasn't because of less access to cigarettes, it was because there was so much education going on. So if we think of this as a public health issue, then we need a public health approach, which means bringing in pediatricians, therapists, educators, all of them having different conversations. And just one of the things we are doing at the moment now is we are beginning to partner with the American Academy of Pediatrics in Maryland, and we are going to be developing, we're looking to develop materials for pediatricians so that they can talk to kids in their well uh, child visit. So you need to bring everyone to the table and it needs to be coming from different groups. And then I think kids listen to other kids often more than they listen to adults. So I think doing a training program for peers, and these are all things that Culture Reframed is planning on doing in the future. But the first thing we're doing after we've built the programs is we, and if anyone's interested, <clears throat> you should contact Culture Reframe, just on our website. We're going to do um, pep talks, parents educating parents, professionals educating professionals, peers educating peers. <laughs> and instead of a book club, we're going to use the Culture Reframe programs and each week you do two modules online. So um, these are the kinds of things that we need to start the conversations because we don't have even the vocabulary to talk mm -hmm. about these things. We even lack the vocabulary. So that's what I would suggest. Excellent. It, it, Tanya and Beth, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I, I think Gail said it perfectly. Um, it's about conversations is crucial when you're talking to these kids about porn. Um, and we have to think that if, even with our own kids, right? Our kids are not with us 24-7, 24, 24 hours a day, right? They mm -hmm. have to go to school and they're around peers. Um, some, if they're on school buses, it happens on school buses. Mm -hmm. I had... Uh, um, one one parent tell me that um, they was watching porn on the school bus mm -hmm. and her daughter ended up getting raped after the, the boys are watching porn on the school bus. So it, it happens and this is crucial to have these conversations and educate. I think education is it's so, so important um, in schools because even when we talk to our young kids today, they they don't know a lot about sexual health and they and it's a culture, right? 
This is the culture where they put out their porn, it's okay. People don't look at porn and see that how harmful porn can be. They're not thinking about this young lady in this video. Like that, it's, she's, it seems like she's enjoying the act, but you don't know what happens after that camera's off. What happens after that? The harm. You just heard the stories that I talked about. You heard what Gail and Beth spoke about and how the process happens. It just doesn't stop right there. So when you're watching porn, it's like you're putting out that it's okay, but you're not thinking about that harm when it comes to that young lady or that young man in that video. It's harmful and it's traumatic and it takes a lifetime for them to get back to, to be feel like they're okay. Like they, they self-blame a lot. They blame themselves for a lot because they were like, oh, why, why me? And let me tell you, as a survivor myself, I did it for many years. I self-blamed. Mm -hmm. If I didn't do this, if I didn't do that, if I knew better than this and that, but I had people, I was young, very, very young, and I had older men in my ear telling me what to do, and I fell mm -hmm. along with it. So it's crucial to talk to your kids, put more education out there. We need that in schools, after school programs. Well said. Um, what was raised in addition to this question was what is it, if there's anything specifically happening with college students on college campuses? Is anybody aware of anything specific to? Okay. Um, another question, did Pornhub's recent policy changes have any effect and are they enough? What kind of regulatory changes could help? No, yes. no effect whatsoever at the moment. So what they did was remember there's millions and millions of videos up there. They took down some um, and I'm not sure even on what basis they took them down. I think some of it was where they knew the women were being trafficked. Um, but what they did is, for example, they got rid of their category <clears throat> incest porn. They didn't get rid of the incest porn videos. They took them under the category of stepbrother, stepsister, stepmother. So no. And um, so it doesn't matter that they took down three or four million videos. There's millions and millions up there. And the worst ones are tucked into other categories. So, mm -hmm. and I have to say, there is, I think, I think they said in the hearings or something in Canada, I think there's six people who monitor the content of the millions and millions and millions of videos. Plus, if you're looking at kids, right, or young looking girls, which is the, the most sought after videos on Pornhub, there's over 500,000 videos with the tags teen or young looking or whatever. And if you want to age those girls, you can't have six people looking that you need forensic pediatricians who know how to age the, these girls. So it's a big PR and I'm waiting to see what the Canadian government does with these hearings. And it is really my fear that this the hearings will be a showcase and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm really thinking of organizing a letter from all different organizations all over the world to Canada to say, we are watching you because mm -hmm. how dare you allow MindGeek to go with who's distributes the vast majority of the world's porn. How dare you let them continue and wreak havoc all over the world. This is not a Canadian issue. You are basically allowing an industry that is in every nook and cranny of the world to carry on completely unfettered with no regulation. So I think we should let Canada know the eyes of the world are on them. Absolutely. And what kind of regulatory changes would help? What would you suggest? Well, first of all, absolute age verification that anyone on a porn set is 18 and above. I mean, we're talking slowly because I want to see the end of this industry. I want to be very clear. I'm not into harm reduction. I want to see it wiped off the face of the earth. But let's be realistic here and see it in steps. So legislation that anyone on the porn set, everyone is 18 and above. It's a law called 2257 which says that's law. However, the porn industry has been fighting that for years. I was an expert witness with the Department of Justice at the Third Circuit trying to save that law. That's one before the Supreme Court. The porn industry has poured millions into getting rid of the only law that protects children from being on porn sets. Number two, we need to have that law reaffirmed. Number two, we need to have a third party age verifier, which they're doing in other countries, that everyone going on a porn site is 18 or above. You have to have a digital chip that has been, and you have to be verified by this third party, given a digital chip, and you're not allowed on a porn site till you've uploaded the digital chip that shows you're 18 and above. So there's things happening right there. And then I would like to see, which is happening now, huge class action suits against Mindy of the women harmed in the making of pornography, mm. the women harmed in the consumption. And I'd like to see it. The truth is the best way to deal with this industry is bankrupt it through class, class action suits. 
suit after suit after suit after suit because you know the pornography if you take down one industry one company another one will grow but if you bankrupt them they'll think twice before they start growing again so that's mm. what i would like to see i've got 15 class action suits around in my head that i could think of right now to do mm -hmm. mm. So a, a subsequent question, and thank you for that, incredibly helpful. Will regulation of the porn industry drive demand for sexual images in underground areas like the dark web? It's already on the dark web. We've got two now. We've got one on the regular web and one on the dark web. No, it's, it's already there. What you're doing when you bring it above ground, you see, pornography should be below ground on the dark web. Because as soon as you bring it above ground, it interfaces with all major capitalist corporations from Visa, MasterCard, mm. venture capitalists, banks, cable operators, webmasters, right? It's unlike trafficking. A, tra a pimp can't go into a venture capitalist bank and say, excuse me, but I need a million dollars to launch this new trafficking, right? They have to find the money elsewhere. A pornographer can, and they do all the time. So actually it's already on the dark web it needs to live underground this industry because the more underground it is the less kids and other people have access to it and the more you make you're taking a risk in accessing it right it suddenly becomes risky legally so yes i would say get this as far underground as the ebola virus lives very far far underground yeah well said um for beth could you provide some more information on the tech and media youth council Sure. So this is something that we're piloting for the first time this spring. Our, our hope is that we're engaging with youth to talk to us about what they're experiencing every day. They know better than anybody sort of what's going on at school, what their peers are dealing with, what they themselves have experienced. And they have lots to share about sort of the messages that they're getting and the messages that they're not getting and the, the, the things that they want their their peers and their friends to know, what they want their parents and caregivers to know, advice for parents and caregivers on how to have some of these conversations, but also how to help some of the multidisciplinary partners who are responding to inform sort of their approach to working with kids. So if we're working with a detective who's speaking with a child whose image has been shared by, or they're talking with an adult online, what might be going on for that child? What would help them feel safer and comfortable? What types of supports and questions can we give? So we're really hoping to have youth-informed guidance, recommendations, suggestions that we can infuse into our practice working with kids, but also spread out in the community to help get um, sort of youth-focused, youth-centered messaging out to the people in Suffolk County and in Boston. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Gail, someone has asked you to restate the sentence. This is a Gail Dines fill in the blank. Pornography delivers patriarchal... Pornography delivers patriarchal ideology to men's brains via the penis a very powerful delivery system. Okay. Thank you. Um, for all of you, um, there's recently been a rise of what is termed feminist porn made by and for women. Does this type of porn have the same harmful grooming effects? Why don't you begin? <laughs> if I have to hear the word feminist porn again, or ethical porn, I think I'm gonna have a good old feminist fit okay <laughs> let me tell you pornography feminist porn is a niche market of the mainstream porn industry it's very smart it's very business savvy and it is as violent and as degrading to women as is so-called porn the queen of feminist porn erica lust uses the templates and narratives of porn it's just a great marketing tool because you know what you can be either a feminist or a pornographer, you can't be both, because the first law of feminism is do no harm to women. So the word feminist and the word pornographer should never, ever be in the same sentence. I think I've made myself clear on that. I think, I think so. I think that, that seems really clear. So along with this, what are your thoughts on the balance between educating young people about the dangers of pornography and slut shaming? I mean, I'll turn to you, Tanya, first. You do an exceptional job of young people really hearing from you what the dangers are and what the challenges are out there, but really also feeling cared for and, and heard. Is there anything you want to speak to about that? Um, yeah, so when we think about, you know, especially the, the young women that we work with, um, 
how they they they're shamed um, because of their past and their history, right? They but they're going through pain as well. Um, these young women has been through a lot of a lot. And for them to be slut shaming and you're this and you're that. And, and you know, that it, it makes them feel less than and it makes these young women feel like there's no life beyond what they already experienced yeah. in their lives. You know, and, and like I said, as a survivor myself, it made me feel, how would I get a good job? I would never be good for school. Um, that pictures of me are out there. There's things that you think of when, when you're out there in that being groomed in that type of setting to where you, where you feel like when you're called so much names and you're shamed so much mm -hmm. to where you're thinking that you're that that's who you are right this is who I am because this is what this person said to me this is what I did and I felt that shame and that guilt but mm -hmm. get, talking to these young girls and and having them to rebuild right let them know there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. You are not what you was before. You're not what you did before. There's more. Who to think I would be here in my life, my choice, six years, and I went back to college and got a degree. No one you would never think that. And this is what we have to teach these young women that don't be ashamed of your past. Embrace your future. Mm. Beautifully said. Is there anything that you, Gail, or, or Beth, want to add about this idea of that when we say porn is bad, that there's the risk of this kind of phenomenon of, of slut shaming or, or um, around those that are in it. Beth, did you want to add something? Yeah, well, I think what's, I want to underscore and echo and just really agree with what Dr. Dines was saying around consent. I think it is revolutionary to talk with young people about consent, about setting their own boundaries, about healthy relationships. The porn culture is so ingrained in our society that I think that was very, very apt to say, like, is there such a thing as really choosing consent among kids? And I think to talk with them about how they can decide what's safe for them, they can decide what they're comfortable with, what their personal boundaries are. I think that is a revolutionary conversation that needs to happen. We get lots of referrals for youth who are sort of acting out these scenarios or they've had different scenarios acted out on them without their consent. And I think it's just critical that we have these conversations to help youth understand that they are in charge of their own bodies and that they can, they get to decide what they're okay with mm -hmm. and what they're not okay with. They don't have to follow this sort of predestined porn culture narrative about what relationships look like. They can define that for themselves. Mm. Well said. I also want to lift up from the chat what Akita, who's a senior survivor mentor with My Life, My Choice, said. It's about unlearning and relearning who they are and operating in that power. Just well said. Right. Gail. Can I also no, make a point? Can I go back a please. few steps? Yeah, so yeah. first of all, I want to problematize, as they say in academia, the concept of slut shaming. It's not slut shaming. It's misogyny. There is no such thing as a slut. If we call it slut shaming, we are agreeing that women are sluts. I'm Jewish. If somebody says something against me, I don't say you're kike shaming. I say you're anti-Semitic. Because if I was to use the word kike, which is the term the Nazis use, why would I use the word that the oppressor put, put on me as a Jew? And as a woman, why would I use the word slut? There's no such thing. Right? There's women who behave in certain ways and we can deconstruct that, but slut is a patriarchal term used to completely police and control women's sexuality. So I think we need to throw slut shaming out and talk about misogyny and talk about the way in which this culture en masse shames women and that's women's sexuality. And women's sexual pleasure, by the way, is also shamed as well. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. from sex ed, very interesting, the studies on sex ed show, first of all, most sex ed does not work. The students hate it, the teachers hate it, it doesn't work. This is what the empirical evidence is showing. One of the most important things in sex ed, they say, is to teach girls about sexual pleasure because they don't know they're entitled to it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what they found, the outcomes of sex said that foreground girls' pleasure, because remember, it's all about scaring them to death. You're gonna get STDs, you're gonna get pregnant. Is actually when you foreground girls' pleasure, what they do is they put off sex for longer and they're less likely to be raped because they're clearer with boundaries about what they do and don't want. Now, again, I'm not putting this on the individual girls. Rape has to go on the perpetrators. Head. But it's interesting that sexual pleasure is such a key thing in sex education to teach girls. And girls don't think they're entitled to pleasure. The latest statistic is 89% of women who have hookup sex do not have orgasms. 
the most basic thing. Why are they even doing it? You don't even get an orgasm out of it. You know, my students, most of them were doing hookup sex all the time and never had orgasms. And I would say, why? What's the point? And they would say to me, well, if not, I'll be alone on a Saturday night. I'll have no date. So I'll give him a blowjob and that's enough, you know? Mm -hmm. I hope you saw in the chat someone just say, I want to be Gail Dines when I grow up. I just hope you oh, nice. win that. Um, be careful what you wish for, by <laughs> um, What are your thoughts on the rise of OnlyFans? Can anyone speak to that? How will this affect our young people? Oh, Do you want to start, Gail? Or? Well, I've actually just done a, a whole research thing into this because I was working, because I just gave a talk to the Colombian government in Colombia. Okay. And... I didn't realize it's the second largest country in the world for sex camming. So um, they're going to regulate it. Anyway, so OnlyFans, unbelievable. In 2018, it had 120,000 content producers. These are women, you know, basically it's like prostitution one step removed because you're not actually got the John in the room, but you're doing everything that John wants. It had 120,000 content producers, i.e. women, in 2019. Last year, it jumped to a million, a million. That's because of COVID, because women need to make money. The other thing that's interesting, now, so OnlyFans is going to take over the porn industry because women get, they give women, they, women only have to give 20% of what they make to OnlyFans, which is much lower than Pornhub. So this is basically a pimping platform, OnlyFans. The second thing is it's a big pimping pyramid scheme because women don't make much money on only fans they have what's called a referral system so that if you get a friend on that to be, join only fans to monetize her own body you get a percentage of the money she makes so not only are they pimping out girls they're turning girls into pimps i mean what a ridiculous kind of society we're living in so only and only fans i could say camming is the is the way of the future for women because women have now been taken back two generations because of covid it's going to take them years to get back a foothold in the job market we know women are still the ones responsible for putting food on the table for children on the whole and taking care of children this has been devastating for women and it's been a big win for the porn and sex industry i think in the interest of time and just having only a few minutes left i'd like each of you to have an opportunity to just give your kind of final thoughts just a minute of what do you most hope folks will take away and do from having seen this who would like to go first i can go first it's okay <laughs> thanks sonia uh, yeah um i um what what i can say um um as uh, you can see, as by this panel, we are all passionate about what we, what we, the work that we do, and the stories that we know. And you just, you heard the stories, and you heard a lot what um, Dr. Dine said and Beth about how it plays out and how it can be harmful. Um, this, this is pain that's endured on a, a lot of young women and some young men. This doesn't go away. And if you if you watch porn or if you know people that watch porn, um, just think about that young lady that's in that film and what happens when that camera goes off. Hmm. Think about that. Think about the harm and the pain the, the, and the trauma that that the life that she had before or the trauma that she's going to live after that. Know that this can be we'll be talking about. We're looking with this is children, children. And how painful this can be. I work with a lot of young ladies and their trauma stays with them for a lifetime. Educate, educate, read, read. Talk to your kids. Put more, put in, all the information you can put out there in the community. You have to do your research. You have to do the work in order to help this point to put it in. We maybe we might not ever put a uh, end of porn, but it has to come to a point to where if we don't work together as a community, this will not come to an end. We cannot. We have to use our voices to speak up against porn because it turns into exploitation as well. Thank you, Tanya. Beth. So sexual exploitation and commercial sexual exploitation of children is child abuse. Period. The exchange of images, the exchange of images when there's money tied to things like OnlyFans or other cash apps, that's child abuse and it's happening all around us. I think for me, I'd love, the biggest takeaway is around having these critical conversations 
if we're not talking about this, if we're not talking with the youth, the young people that we work with and in our families, the porn industry is going to have those conversations for us and they already are. Um, and those looking to endanger and exploit kids will, will use that system and take advantage of that system to harm kids in our communities. So conversations are critical and it's not too soon. It's never too soon. We need to act now. Thank you, Beth. Gail. Um, I'm with the radical, uh, the, the radical feminist movement that says that if you see something you don't like, you tear it down, brick by brick, piece by piece. We have to tear this entire sex industry down. Women and children simply cannot live with this sex industry beside us as a massive juggernaut. And we have to really get bold. We have to get courageous. And let's face it, we're women. We are bold and we are courageous. Without women, God knows what this world would look like, okay? So we have to come together. You know, men of good faith are welcome to join us, but it's going to be us, as always, who are going to change the world. And I don't know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and let me tell you, I'm ready for a change. So I am ready to tear this structure down piece by piece and we know what we owe it to our daughters and profoundly we owe it to our sons as well that's important so and I'm the mother of a son okay and I speak on behalf of my son and all of the sons as well that for everybody we tear this structure down thank you thank you to all three of you extraordinary women for what you've brought today I hope folks will join us on Wednesday, May 5th at noon for our next in our prevention series where we're gonna focus on the demand and the role of male allies. And also that you'll join us on June 3rd for our annual Turn on the Light event in which we um, come together to celebrate the work and celebrate survivors. So June 3rd at 7.30, it's free to attend. It'll be live streamed on YouTube. Thank you all so much for being here. Gail, Beth and Tanya, thank you so much for your time. You're extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.